Hello, everyone, and welcome to Trickster Month, week two here at Rock Eyes. With us today is the sometimes sensatious, somewhat flirtatious, and always vivacious Mark Gus Scott from Jersey's own Trickster. <laughs> what was the first thing you said? Sometimes what? <laughs> Sometimes flirtatious, but we won't let your wife in on it. Oh, that. I love you. You're so funny. How you been, buddy? <laughs> very, very good. It's glad to have you back aboard again, and uh, welcome to Trickster Month. God bless you. I tell you, I'm most excited very proud to be here with Rock Eyes. <laughs> well, congratulations on your new release, New Audio Machine. Um, incredible record. I can't Thanks. wait to start getting, you know, people start getting the feedback on this one. What was it like for you to go back in the studio again after such a long time? You know, it was weird, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't always have the most positive experiences in the studio. Uh, I loved making our second record. The first one was a big challenge. Uh, and I think also in the past, I don't know, we, all, uh, we had experiences where we built songs in the, in the studio, and it was very frustrating. I learned a song a certain way, and then the guys would say, you know what, let's try this. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I practiced it for freaking how many weeks doing it that way? i got to do it a different way now. I, can't, you know, it, it just, uh, I guess I'm, maybe I'm a stickler for that sort of thing. But i got to tell you, I was very hesitant with this whole make a new album thing after 20 years. You know, I didn't know. But the thing that started to really get me excited about it, Steve had some demos. That's where it started. Where he had some riffs and he had some ideas, and I was like, "Oh wow, that could be really cool." And we take it in the studio, we cut some tracks. Like, holy crap, play a bass track on it, lay this out. I was like, "Oh my god, this thing is really sounding pretty damn good." We throw some vocals on it, we get some guys to mix. I'm like, "Holy crap, I think we got something here," you know. <laughs> so it was really weird. The more we did, the better it sounded. I'm like, holy crap, you know. I think we all started to get excited. We got bit. We're like, "Oh my god, if that song sounds like that, I can't wait to record this thing," you know. So we, we really. <laughs> we had a very positive experience, and I think everybody's very happy and very proud with the way things came out. That's great. That's great. What was it? What was the first song of the CD that you started working on together? The first one we did was "Drag Me Down," which, funny, is the first cut on the album, and uh, that was also co-written by the guy from Sticks. You know who that is, don't you, Glenn Burtnick? Uh, he uh, wrote it with Stevie, and I think Glenn even played some stuff on it. He played some uh, ancillary guitar, maybe some backing vocals, that sort of thing. Uh, he, I think he put a couple of electronic drum hits in there. Uh, but great guy, and that came out with a brilliant song. Uh, I think it's outstanding. It uh, starts out acoustic, then blows in heavy to a, to a rock and freaking verse. Uh, I, I love it. I love it. And we had that in the bag for some time. And it was that and the coolest thing that we did first. Coolest thing was also mixed by Pete Evick, the uh, guitarist from Brett Michaels' band. And right there, those two songs, uh, I think what, what uh, caught Frontier Records uh, president, Serafino, and he, uh, he, uh, he signed us up, and we were like, wow. And once we had that under our belt with a record label that was really excited about it, he heard more demos that we had. He said, guys, let's do something here. And we're like, all right, let's do it. So we just we got really excited. You know, it went from just having fun to getting serious again. And to uh, be given a second shot like that, to go out and really do it. Now we're going worldwide distribution. We're going Russia. We're going Europe. We've got J Japan, all U.S. It's getting very serious now. And this snowball thing is really ridiculous. And we're all very excited, and we're just so proud of the way everything came out. Very happy, very happy. Now, as you mentioned, uh, the song that you mentioned second there was the coolest thing. And as we were just talking about a little bit before we started the interview, I mean... It's just an amazing track. It's an amazing, amazing track. I gotta tell you something. One and thing I, I think I, I, it's funny. But some people say that I'm Steve Brown's biggest fan. I tell you what, I've known that young man since he was thirteen. Well, let's see, eleven years old. I was thirteen, uh, and his guitar playing, number one, has always inspired me. And his songwriting, that little son of a bitch. I swear to God, when he put the pen to the paper and he starts stomping on a riff. Buddy, I, you know, he's got me. He's got me following. I will back that son of a gun up. I tell you what, that song kicks some ass, and I'm, I just can't tell you. It's really something. And you know what? When you do interviews or whatever, and you talk about the new album, and everyone's oh, it's the greatest thing. But I can't wait for people to hear what's on this record, and they're going to see for themselves what the hell's going on. Don't take my word for it. Listen to go go to iTunes and listen to a little clip. You're going to get hooked. You're going to hear something special. I really that, that's what I'm most proud of. Really, just that we did, what we've got down on tape here. Because, well, I guess not tape anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's uh, I'm so proud, so excited. And when people hear, it, we're just going to kick them in the ass. It's really going to be something. 
Well, as I mentioned, it is. That 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 song in particular is a really, really special song, but there's a lot of exactly. so many great moments on this C D. I mean, uh there are your prototypical trickster songs, which your longtime trickster fans are absolutely gonna adore. But then there's so many other different directions to this. I mean, even um just mentioning what you had said about the first track, Drag Me Down, I mean yeah. I thought that has a little bit of almost like a Tesla feel to it. Yeah, the way that yeah, it starts yeah. to it. And it's something different that you haven't heard out of the band and I think a lot of people are gonna appreciate appreciate that. I, I, will, I can't disagree with you one iota. I, again, I'm getting excited, buddy. This is really cool. And I think it's just a natural reflection of how the band has grown individually. You put it together, and that's just what happens, you know? Uh, I, 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 again, I don't want to trump it up, but, buddy, when people plug this thing in and just listen to it, they're going to be going to raise an eyebrow. I, I, people that don't like the band, they're going to, have, they're going to hear a song in there somewhere. And they're going to say, holy crap, this is Trickster. You know, they're not going to believe it. They're not going to fucking believe it. Right. Now, I know this is a tough question for you. I asked PJ the same one. It's there we pro- go. It's your prototypical question that you got to ask when anybody comes out with a new release. No, I'm not wearing underwear. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have a favorite song off the release, personally, that you like personally? You know what? Uh, I have a few favorite songs. I can't say I could just pick one. Like, for instance, if you take a ballad like Coolest Thing, which I think is the best ballad on the record, uh, and you put it up against a rock tune like My Machine, you, you, you can't really compare the two, you know? Uh, but I will say Dirty Love was always a very uh, was a favorite because I love the guitar riff, and the drum is, the groove on the drums is just really cool. Uh, rock and Roll Save Your Soul is another one where the riff is just crazy, and it gives me the opportunity to back up that riff. That, that's what I love about playing live. When he rips out a riff, and I can back him up just by slamming a freaking beat. There ain't nothing better in the world than that. There's nothing better in the world than stomping the shit out of the fucking beat. That's why I do this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's not just one song. I think there's uh, going to be one song for everybody that they're going to like on this record, you know? But uh, I think different people like different songs for different reasons. And something like The Coolest Thing, we keep bringing it up. That's a special song. That's, a, that's really something hot. And... Uh, if you if you want to see, if you want people to listen to one song on that record, I think that that song is really something special. And you don't even have to be a rock fan to listen to a song like that. That's a beautiful goddamn song. Mm-hmm. Now I understand you just finished up shooting the first video uh, in over fifteen years for you guys. Tell me about what that was like. Hey, uh, <laughs> 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 it was fun. <laughs> The worst part is we booked it in the studio on the second floor, two flights of stairs. That was the first time I lifted drums, and I couldn't tell you how long. Like, son of a bitch, who booked this goddamn gig? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I right, wheel it right in, no problem. But, oh, my God, what a freaking workout. Uh, that aside, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. You know, honestly, we had fun doing this stuff. Uh, we flew Pete in. He got to come home for a little while to Jersey, and uh, we went to the friend's studio, Lighthouse Studios, West Milford, New Jersey. Uh, good buddy Joe over there. We just rocked it up, man. Had a great time. Just turned on the cameras, and that's all we got, you know? And uh, just had a good time. I mean, that's the thing. We never made work out of this sort of shit, you know? I truly believe people that make it a, a chore effort. Buddy, you know, I think you're just doing something wrong. Uh, this is this is what it's all about. We elect to do this personally because it's fun. It's freaking the best thing in the world. So I don't know. We I, we pretty much have fun just about everything we do. So that's why we put it back together. Not because it was a chore. So because shit, man, we love doing this crap. Mm-hmm. Now I really think uh, tattoos and misery was an excellent, excellent choice as your first single. Um, you know, it, yeah. I, not, I, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, the president of the record company, Serafino, he picked it. He picked it as the first thing. We thought about it, but he said, you know what, this ought to be it. We're like, you know what, we think so, too. That's a very good idea. It's amazing when you actually have a, a record company that's in sync with the minds of the band. You know what I mean? I think something like that. It, this is an amazing thing. The crap like this doesn't happen. Usually you go to bed losing sleep over, like, what are they talking about? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, we got some synergy here. And uh, I think you're dead on the money. I love it. I love this song. And as a first thing, I think it's a good representation of what the hell's going on over here. Yeah, because it's definitely not your typical trickster track at all. And, uh, Agreed. You know, definitely sound has a lot more maturity to it, a lot different sound. It's a fuller, fatter sound. It's a great, great song to start off with. Um, what do you attribute that to after all these years and uh, the different kind of writing styles that you've developed into? You know, I, I, like I said before, it's like four different guys. You go away. We, uh, I didn't even see Steve for about 15 years or so. 
maybe 14 years. Uh, everybody does their own thing. Pete did a solo project. PJ did a solo project. Steve did several solo projects. Uh, so I think when you put it back together, uh, just naturally something happens. You know what I mean? And now, uh, maybe with some people it doesn't work that way. Maybe they get stuck in a certain rut and they write the same crap that they did 20 years ago. I don't know. As far as we're concerned, something happens. What is it exactly? Yeah, I'm not quite sure, but you're going to hear it when you plug in the songs. And when you say, like, you listen to Tattoo of Misery, and you listen to the old tricks, you hear something that might be reminiscent, but then you hear something like, where the hell did they get this from? So, I don't know, buddy. It's a weird goddamn thing, but I think it's a beautiful thing, and that's why when we started putting it together in the studio, you look at each other like, oh, my God, this sounds really good. <laughs> we didn't even realize it ourselves until we started recording just how good the stuff really sounded. I mean, we had a riff, we had a demo, we had an idea for a song. Sometimes we even had a complete song, but it didn't sound like that until we all started playing. Really weird. And when we listened back and mixed it just right, it's like, holy crap, we really got something here. So I am getting really excited. And yes, it's a weird goddamn thing. <laughs> now, you and I have discussed this before in the past. And as I always said, while I do enjoy the first two releases, here maybe a little bit more than the original, I never really felt on CD they were able to capture what this band was truly all about all right. until now. It, yeah, I well, really I, I got to tell you, you there's other you people that have said that. that. Uh, I think that's not an inaccurate statement. Uh, I think, you know, that, 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 I think it's probably a more of an accurate statement than anything. Uh, I, think, I, I, I think we have a lot more enjoyment playing live than we do in the studio, but I think over time we, we learned how to make it more fun for ourselves to really capture something special in the studio, and maybe that's what New Audio Machine has done. You know, take an analytical look at it, if you will. Uh, it, it's, I'm, I, and even still, I'm, I can't be 100% sure, but one thing's for sure, when we turn it on, we have big smiles on our face when we hear it, you know, and we're proud. And to have that level of pride in what you do when you, when you look back at the end of the day's work, so to speak, that's something special. And, and, and if you come in to me and say, hey, Mark, bro, I think, uh, you know, you've you really captured something that you haven't captured before, and you go, you know what? We think so, too. And uh, that, 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 aside from just a personal satisfaction level, it's a true representation of people, what we're all about. And I think that speaks volumes over anything else. You know what I mean? And I think that gives a certain level of pride. And, I, again, Dave, I think, you, I think you're dead on the money with that. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever regret that the band was actually stereotyped the way it was in the first place on the first couple of albums? Well, regret, you know, it is what it is. I don't know what it's regret. Yeah, you know, I guess everybody wants to be accepted by everybody. Realistically, it never happens that way, you know? Uh, hell, if you're, if you're one of the most credible bands, Metallica, they got busted for, uh, well, at least they got slammed by some of their hardcore fans by selling out, by, you know, by making a great record. Uh, you know, so I, I don't really know if I could, uh, you know, be bitter about something like that. It's going to happen no matter what genre you're in or what you're going to do. Or even if you make golf balls, there's going to be some competitors or some fans of your product saying, oh, you should have done it this way. You know what, pal? It is what it is. And, uh, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't do things to please everyone else. We do things pretty much to please ourselves. Uh, that almost sounds self-gratifying. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, all kidding aside, you know, you, know, you take it into consideration to some degree, but you don't write songs or write stuff to please everyone else. You do it because that's what's inside, and that's what you do. And the way it comes out is the way it comes out, pal. You know, we don't put it in a microcomputer and say, listen, we would like to appeal to a demographic of 25 to 48. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know? So uh, what you what you hear is what you got, pal. <laughs> and there's going to be people, when this comes out, we're going to get slammed by some people because they don't like us or some shit like that. And if, uh, you know, a wave of people get behind an idea like that, then fine, screw you. You know, we're still going to do it anyway. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I don't have regrets about it for me now. You know, what we did, what we did, and we were very proud of what we did. Let me tell you something. Aside from all that bullshit, when you come fucking see Trickster Live, Fuck you all, I swear to God. Uh, even people that weren't fans of the band come see us live, they say, we'll kick your ass. Like, for real. On stage, there's very few bands that outperform us. We could really just whack it the fuck out. Absolutely. I definitely agree with you there. I mean, that, that, it's a whole different Yeah, I mean, experience. I'm not talking out of my ass here. I mean, well, very seriously, we're quite aggressive. Uh, very few guitar players play more aggressive than Steve Riff. When it comes to bass playing, PJ will fucking knock you on your ass. Me, I'm a ham and egger. <laughs> and when it comes to, you know, Pete... 
you fucking rock and roll. His voice is better now than it ever has been. That son of a bitch can fucking sing. So I'll tell you what, you know, you, you got some questions about us. Come see it live. We'll kick your ass. <laughs> Now, you had originally left the music industry for many, many years after the demise of Trickster. Yes. Uh, tell me what or who made you come out of retirement, and how difficult was it for you to get your chops back after such a long time? Yeah, well, first off, as far as getting chops back, it's not like I never played drums. Uh, you know, I, I didn't like, have to dust them off and <laughs> all that kind of crap. I, I still played, but certainly not the level I was. Uh, but... Uh, it was weird. Uh, I, I, you know, I think what was the strangest part, after maybe 10 years, maybe 12 years, I started getting fan mail. I'm like, where the hell is this coming from? You know, and then it came more and more. I get Czech Republic, Poland, like weird. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is so strange. So uh, then all of a sudden I hear about this thing called Rocklahoma. I'm like, what's a Rocklahoma? And these people write, hey, you guys playing Rocklahoma? I said, what are you talking about? I'm fucking together. <laughs> so uh, it, it started slowly, and then over a couple of years, it just got bigger. People started asking. Next thing you know, if Brett Michaels called and says, hey, you guys want to uh, tour with us? Who tour with us over the summer? We're like, Jesus Christ, you're on the fucking band together. And he says, well, if you want to get it together, and Pete had a, uh, he's married, and I was married, and we got all this, you know, we did, I guess everybody had shit going on. We just couldn't really pull it together that quick. And it's Brett's like, well, listen, here's my agent's phone number. Give him a freaking call, and uh, if you want to do something. So, so what the hell, you know, Steve calls Pete. I call this guy, and everybody's like, uh, we better hook up. One day, Steve comes to my restaurant with a video camera behind him at the Trickster reunion. I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was funny. So we called uh, Brett's agent. And we booked some shows, and in 2008, we did Rocklahoma, and it was fantastic. And we opened for Poison in Kadat, Wisconsin, and we opened for the band Boston, and we did uh, M3 with, uh, uh, who the hell was that, Cinderella and uh, Scorpions, and it was freaking great. Mm. Yeah, you know, we had, to, we had some great success, and we had, you know, had some fun. And all of a sudden, we said, you know, let's push to the next level. Let's start thinking about doing that. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And all of a sudden, we got this. I'm like, holy shit, this sounds great. <laughs> you know, and apparently somebody at Frontier DMI said so also. So this whole thing has been a big snowball. And we really haven't tried that hard. <laughs> We're just having fun, you know? Right. It's not like we get the three-piece suit on and get into the, uh, you know, musical chamber of commerce and attempt to make something happen. We're just out there doing it, man. You know, it's just like, uh, it's really weird how this whole thing has materialized. But, uh, shoot, we're having fun, you know? And uh, I guess, yeah, I had, to, I had to lose some weight. I had a restaurant at the time, and, shit, I put on some pounds. What a freaking pain in the ass that was, uh, to, you know, to have food and liquor <laughs> at your side and to not eat when you, whatever you want to, and you have to lose 35 pounds. What a freaking pain in the ass. So, yeah, I guess I had to get some of that. I got to do it right now, too, you know? When you're down and, you know, in the studio and just chilling out, and I got a nice sofa and a nice TV and stuff. <laughs> it's hard not to take advantage of that. But now, dude, I have, you know, I'm, I'm almost not drinking. Let's say, you know, 100%, but I'm almost not drinking. You know, I'm out there jogging. I'm hitting the weights. I'm freaking jamming. I got a new Pearl endorsement. And, you know, I want to look good in the picture. So, <laughs> you know, there's shit you got to do, man. And uh, to be honest with you, play a high-energy set that Trickster does even for an opening act. Shit, man, you better be in fucking shape, so I don't want to die on stage. <laughs> now, uh, you had spent many years in the restaurant business as well, uh, eventually opening your own restaurant, which um, we have spoken about here on Rock Guys before, which was the yeah. Copper Bottom. Mm -hmm. um, that quickly became my favorite restaurant of all time, as well as oh, many of thanks, my friends bro. and stuff that were up you know, had yeah, the privilege of I got, going I, I got to say, it was always a pleasure to have you in, bro. You know, but, nothing but love. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you liked it so much. Believe me, I, you know, I, and I let me tell you something. No one liked it better than I did. Uh, no one, no one had more fun over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, but it, it's kind of weird. And uh, I got rid of it more recently. When we got signed, I said, you know what? I got a new direction now. And I think I also ran to, into some big challenges over at the restaurant. Uh, one of it was personally my my attitude level was freaking horrible. I think it got to a point where it started to hate people. Believe it or not, uh, the, 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 the famous quote is, uh, "Oh, the restaurant is a tough business." First off, let's start with business in general, I don't know one business that's an easy business, all right? That being said, a lot of people say it's a tough business. They really don't know what the fuck is so tough about it. Now, there's a lot of things that are, but I'll give you one of the biggest reasons why the restaurant business is the toughest business. Everybody thinks they know what it is. They really don't have a goddamn idea. And I'll tell you right now before anybody thinks they know what the hell they're talking about. 
the biggest ch- one of the biggest challenges with a goddamn restaurant is exceeding expectations of people with unrealistic expectations. Uh, what does that actually mean? Well, people think that their food's going to miraculously materialize absolutely fucking perfect inside of 10 seconds of them watering it, you know? <laughs> then they're going to have someone dust them off, bring their car up front in pristine condition. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and sometimes, and, and they think this happens at McDonald's. Uh, you know, you want to pay $5 for a million-dollar service, and it really just doesn't work that way. And some people walk with their noses up in the air, and, you know, there's some more realistic individuals, but when you're dealing with high volume, on a daily basis, with people's expectations out in friggin' left field, to exceed that expectation, really accommodate people, is very, very difficult. And I think I made it a personal challenge to take on that responsibility on a daily basis. I kind of drove myself crazy. So now I'm saying, "Fuck him! I'm, I'm going to have some, some fun of my own." <laughs> <laughs> well, I, just... I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think I drove myself a little nuts. <laughs> I really developed a really bad attitude, and uh, it was not healthy. It really wasn't good. Well, we really will miss it. I mean, I can honestly say in my life, I have never actually missed a restaurant before, but I do oh, I definitely you, miss thanks, the Capper Bottom. Well, thanks, so buddy. right now, I know, as you mentioned, and obviously, you're back into the music industry full throttle. But, Absolutely. But do you ever see yourself getting involved in something like that again? Uh, certainly not on the level that I was. I mean, at the time, I was, I was front of the house, man. I was rocking the whole thing. And uh, there, a, a, a large majority of my day, uh, if in fact, if in fact I do it again, which I, I'm doubtful about, it. I don't know, maybe a bar. I like liquor, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> more profit in liquor too. But uh, I, if I did try to do it on more of an administrative level with general managers in place, as opposed to me taking on all the responsibility, I just don't see me taking that on again. I've done the challenge. I don't need to challenge myself. I truly believe that some of the greatest challenges in life is trying to make life not so fucking challenging. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. We'll see. But right now. Biggest challenge is taking Trickster around the world. And uh, all my focus and attention is put on that. Whatever needs to be done will be done, and we will conquer the fucking world. It's really that simple. So what are your hopes and for the band and uh, the new release? <laughs> uh, we want to play on every continent on the planet, including Antarctica. I'd like to be the first one to play at the North Pole. <laughs> 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 Has a rock band ever played at the North Pole? Not that I can recall. Okay, dude, let's call Guinness, because we're going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now we want to play as many places on this planet as fucking possible. We have distribution through a uh, fantastic record company right now. We're just about on every continent, if I'm not mistaken. And the ones that we are, we're going to freaking get there. Uh, we've got a great record that warrants the kind of attention that we're looking to really produce. And uh, we have apparently a fan base that's uh, thirsty for this sort of thing. So put the shit together and let's freaking make it happen, pal. Mm. I'm very excited about what we got cooking. And uh, I truly believe that the material warrants that kind of attention. Mm. Uh, you know, I just, I, I, I'm so proud of the material. I, I just think that the, the songs in and of itself really speak. And uh, it's not all because of me. It's because of what everybody did together. And I think it's really something special. Now, I understand you've got some shows and festivals lined up already. Tell me yeah. about what your live set is going to be like. All uh, right. Uh, it's going to, well, it's going to be a mix of everything we've done. Uh, it's going to have some trickster one uh, stuff, things like give it to me good, you know, the, the, the standards, of course. Uh, we're going to have some tracks from here. We're going to have some things from, uh, from the new one, and, you know, and, uh, and maybe a bag of tricks. You know, we're, it's gonna be, <laughs> we're gonna have some fun, and here's another thing: we're gonna do some uh, shows that we open up for bigger bands. We're gonna do some headlining shows, so the set's gonna vary to some degree. Just about every show you see us do, you know, it's not gonna be Cookie Girl. Let's do this again. You know, we, we mix it up. Uh, we know a lot of people also see multiple shows. You want to make it boring for them, you know? We have some fun. We have some fun, but you're gonna get a taste of everything, including the new stuff, which is uh, and it's not gonna be all new stuff, but you're gonna hear stuff. And, again, we wouldn't play it if we didn't think it was good, so please enjoy. Great, great. Now, do you have a favorite venue or place you like to play? Meadowlands Arena, absolutely. <laughs> 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 the hometown arena in New Jersey, East Rutherford. 
uh, uh, well, well, is known around here as the Meadowlands Arena. Right now it's called the IZOT Center. It used to be called the Brendan Byrne Arena. And after that, it was the Continental Airlines Arena. We'll see who has the naming rights by the time we play there again. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the place when we were kids, we saw our rock idols. My first concert was Foreigner 4. And I saw that, what the hell was that, early 80s, I think? 82, yeah. something like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I, when I saw that, I, I looked at a foreigner and I heard a bass drum. I was like, holy crap, that's what I want to do. So, rock and roll. And when we got to do that, we uh, opened, it was 1991, off the first record. We got to play there for the first time with opening for uh, Scorpions. And then in 92, we played there again, opening for Kiss. So, just to, uh, to play that, that house alone was the big dream come true. That's the reason that that's the thing that started us off. When we, you know, when we saw our idols, we saw them at the Meadowlands. So to play that place, that was that was the dance, so to speak. That was that was the gig, man. There's any more special place on the face of this planet? It's that room right there. People could say, "Oh, come on over and play the biggest stadium in America." So you know what? I'd rather play the Meadowlands. <laughs> <laughs> There's something special about that place, man. It's the most special place in my heart. Now, okay, speaking of live gigs, I okay. just have to ask you, Maybe. what do you remember about the now infamous Turlock, California game? <laughs> Where the hell did you, <laughs> did I tell you about that? Oh, no, I did some digging for this guy. Oh, you son, oh, did PJ say something, that son of a bitch? Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, my God, you know, now you're going to get me in trouble. Because I don't know what he didn't tell you. <laughs> All right, well, the, the, the loosely based, and we'll go with a step-by-step -step account, but if you do a search, I'm willing to bet that there's more horny women per capita inside that area of California than anywhere on the planet. <laughs> Holy crap. You know, if you, you, you hear about stories backstage and blah, blah, blah. Well, this happened on the stage, and that's where it started. We have some crazy crew members and... We did this thing. We brought the lights down low. We did the blind man moves. I think as our uh, guitar tech, uh, Howie, gets on stage, and he's like, yeah, that, 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 we got our buddy J.D. up there, and he gets up there, and he, these are just friends of ours. That's not they play anything great or anything. And he's like, come on, join the fun. And all of a sudden, somebody's playing the drums, and I, I get to go up front. I start seeing that girl up there in the front row. So why don't you come up here? She comes up, and a friend of hers comes up, too. Ooh, the lights are down low, and... Next thing you know, these women just don't have clothes on. I don't know what happened. <laughs> the lights get a little lower. And a couple more girls come on stage, and I, I, just for some reason, the, the clothes vanish. I don't know what happened. I can't tell you. And for, next thing you know, it, uh, I, I wasn't a virgin anymore. So I <laughs> <laughs> Now, the thing that's amazing about that, it didn't just happen there. It then went to backstage. Back to the hotel through the whole night. I mean, it was just out of control. It was one of those out of control nights, and it started on the stage. I mean, people were watching this. This was freaking unbelievable. You know, it was one of those true classic rock and roll moments. And mind you, this was a very long time ago. I believe it was 1991. So please, I, I'm I'm absolved from any wrongdoing. <laughs> <laughs> I think your statute of limitations is up. I'm telling you, man. Oh my God. But wow, what? A, let me. T uh, it it was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. But uh, uh, the people who uh, We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, certainly a classic night in trickster history. Uh, I, I must say, I had a great time. <laughs> and I'm infection-free. <laughs> Now, Trickster was one of those many thousands of bands that fell victims of the time under the boots of Nirvana and the whole grunge era. Yeah. Do you feel it's becoming easier for a band like Trickster to be able to recapture an audience nowadays? Yes and no. Uh, I'll explain my answer. Uh, yes, in the sense there are, uh, you know, it, it's typically at least for Trickster, we have a demographic or a certain fan base that's still out there. That's out of a certain age now. It's 20 years later. The people that were 18 back then are now 38 years old. And they have the means, motive, and the opportunity to go see Trickster. The means, you know, they have more money. To, you know, they can make their own money. Instead of don't worry about working at 7-Eleven. They actually have real jobs. And, you know, they can afford a concert ticket. And we don't charge a million dollars for a ticket. Uh, they have the motive. They want to revisit their youth and hear, holy crap, Trickster. Remember the great times we used to have back then? Let's go see them. And the opportunity, we're coming around to play with a new album. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. But, uh, but as far as the bad side, uh, there's no more MTV. Radio, things like Z-Rock aren't around as much like, uh, like it used to be. So trying to crack the marketplace might be a little tougher. It's a little different. Uh, it's certainly the, the uh, landscape of the business has changed substantially 
in the past 20 years. We had a certain method of operation when it came to marketing. Doing it today, it's a different ball game, pal. You know, and uh, hell, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's different. And if you don't roll with it, it's a challenge. It really is. But to go over the first step, first thing first, making a great goddamn record is paramount. And I truly believe Trickster has that well under their belt. And, you know, it starts, that's where it starts. You got a great song, people are going to hear it. Now, other than Trickster, you've been working a lot with other independent artists as well over the past few years. Tell me a little about that. Uh, other than me playing other than Trickster? Yeah, I've been playing with some people. Uh, Bobby Masano. He's a Grammy-nominated blues guitarist, fantastic, a good old friend of mine, Bobby Masano. Uh, he's got some fantastic music, and the, the point when I, when I play with him, it's a lot different than Trickster. I'm more laid back. Uh, it's not slamming the crap out of the drum, so to speak, more dynamic uh, at times. Uh, it's just a different vibe, playing the blues as opposed to playing hair metal, you know. <laughs> it's a substantial difference. Uh, that's when I still play with a disco band. That was fun. Some buddies of mine, uh, Huggy Bear and the Sweat Hogs. That was a freaking who? Oh my God! These guys dressed up. Well, first of all, the lead singer dressed up in a bear costume <laughs> with sequins, and and they had background singer girls. I mean, this this band rocked, dude. Well, you know, it was more like disco, Studio Fifty Four stuff. But oh man, it pumped. Talking about getting people dancing, having a great time. And I, I personally, uh, you know, call me a fact, I love disco. I love dance music. There's some heavier drums in dance music than there is in some rock and roll out there. So I just had a great time just pocketing the beat. It, it was awesome. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, those are the two big ones that come to mind. Uh, I did little gigs here and there with some people, but, you know, nothing, you know, you keep my chops alive, yeah. But otherwise, I, mean, I didn't play that much. I got to more uh, domestic stuff. Uh, getting married, having a family, I've got, you know, a bunch of kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, it was a little different. And uh, i got to tell you what, having Steve come through the doors of that restaurant a few years ago and putting the band back together, it's been... Uh, it's been a beautiful goddamn thing, and I can't say how happy I am. I'm really happy, and I think for a long time, I was questioning how happy I really was. Uh, doing this now, I got a big goddamn smile on my face, and I can't wait to get out there and kick some ass. Who were your biggest inspirations, both as a person and as a musician? You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, it, people used to ask me, who's your, who's your favorite, uh, what's your inspiration in music? And I would say guys like Gene Simmons and David Lee Roth. And they didn't necessarily play drums, but it was an attitude thing, you know? When I met, when I, when I thought of Gene Simmons, even before I met him, uh, that guy, just his attitude, it, like I played, like, like I felt I, I was seeing him, you know what I mean? Uh, David Lee Roth, same thing, a certain swagger in the way he was with the way I wanted to play. It sounds kind of weird. I don't know if that makes any sense to people. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it wasn't just how a guy hit the drums. It was just an attitude thing, you know, persona or something like that. I think I adapted some of that into playing, too, you know. And also maybe it's just my own personality, you know. So uh, you know, when you say both, actually, that's a good, it's a great way to phrase the question, you know, as far as me personally and musically. Uh, you know, I, 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 I got to meet these people and hang out with these people over time. So to have an image in mind and then actually meet them and see what kind of people they are, and, you know, it, it's, it's pretty goddamn cool. Uh, and I incorporate that into my own personality maybe as well, you know, maybe some certain traits. Maybe certain traits I don't incorporate into my personality. <laughs> but but uh, it's really weird. We've, ha we've had a unique opportunity to meet our idols people we looked up to that inspired us to start this whole goddamn thing. That's messed up, you know what I mean? To, to, uh, the guy used to look in, into his eyes at an album cover and vinyl and say, man, I want to be just like that. I had to hang out and have dinner with him three nights a week. That, that screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's certainly a unique opportunity, and I think it does something to you. It certainly molds character, and uh, I, th I think you have a certain perception of what this person's going to be before you meet them, and then when you meet them, maybe that's altered somewhat. So you keep that sort of thing in check. You know, if there's anything that you do to inspire somebody, whether it's professionally, personally, musically, you want it to be a certain, you want it to be a certain effect, and you want it to be real. And uh, I think that's something we all try to keep in check with our own personal personalities. Now, as you mentioned, you have had the opportunity to meet a lot of your uh, childhood icons throughout your life, yeah, and actually even fortunate. play with them sometimes. Yes, Have sir. you ever been starstruck by someone that you actually met? You know, that's funny. Uh, 
<laughs> it was funny. I'll tell you a funny story. It was early on in the band, and uh, normally, I, we, I guess at the time, it was maybe around 87, 1986, 87, and we just finished our first demo tape, and uh, Bon Jovi was coming out with Slippery When Wet. They'd finished up their 7800 Fahrenheit tour, and they just finished Slippery When Wet, and John Bon Jovi was going to the Hard Rock Cafe in New York to do an interview with Scott Muni. So Pete, singer, Pete Lauren, hears about it on the radio. Disney called Gus. John Bon Jovi's going to be at the fucking Hard Rock. You're the mouth of the band. I got a press kit. You're going to give him that press kit. You're going to talk to him, tell him to freaking give us a call, hook us up. I go, Pete, well, let's go. Go down to the Hard Rock right now. <laughs> here we go. We get dressed up. We get the press kit all together. We got some news clippings in there, the brand new demo. Got a big trickster sticker on it, you know. And he comes by. I got a bag. He goes, here he goes. Oh, there he is. I'm going to talk to him. Here he is. Hey, John. And I froze up. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so Pete looks at me, he slaps me, he goes, what the frick did the guy say? I, I just did, I did away, I just, give me that goddamn package. <laughs> so he goes, he runs out, he goes, hey, John, here's the package, you know, we got a bed, we got to check this out. He goes, okay, dude, thanks. And then what's funny about it, on the, on the package we gave him was a big trickster sticker, and he took this picture while holding it in a magazine. He came in a magazine with a big trickster logo on it. was pretty funny. So needless to say, three days later, he calls Pete up. He goes, hey, Pete, it's General Bon Jovi. I just know I listen to your stuff. I think you got a lot of potential. He says, here's my address. He gives us an address in New York City. It was his management company. He says, you got some more stuff? Send me some truck, man. We'll keep in touch. Take care. It's like, holy shit, I'm going to Bon Jovi. He fucking called us. So, uh, it, it, pretty funny. And normally, I'm the guy, hey, right there, Mr. Ryan, I'm, I'm the mouth. I talk to everybody. Hey, it's a beautiful thing. I love you. And I, I, don't know, I don't know what happened that day, but it just didn't work. <laughs> 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 Need to say, we got to hang out uh, many times after that. There was never a problem. But for some reason, it just didn't work that day. <laughs> I think maybe the pressure was just too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, okay, funny story. And then, uh, you know, we ended up getting friendly, and John actually helped us get on the Scorpions tour. And uh, I guess a number of other things. So he always helped us out. He kind of was like our, maybe, maybe a little guardian for us, maybe uh, helping us out along the way. He's a super, super nice gentleman. What would you most like to be remembered for? <sighs> yeah, uh, you know what? <laughs> to be remembered, number one, I think that's awesome. Uh, to be remembered for something in particular? Huh? Gee, I don't know. Uh, I, I think number one, character. Uh, not just playing drums, not just doing music, but uh, if a certain image comes to mind when you think of Mark Gus Scott, think of a decent freaking guy. And you know what, Gus, you did all right. That's good enough for me. Uh, yeah. You know, if I have any aspirations in life, you know, I guess everybody wants to be remembered. And, uh, you know, to think about uh, through the generations that someone thinks about, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I'll, I'll let time uh, tell for itself whether it's going to happen and just how it's going to happen exactly. But uh, if I can just be the best person I can be and kick some ass, I think it's a good combination. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mark, uh, that is about it. Is there anything else that you'd like to say in conclusion? Uh, say yeah, first of all, Dave, you know I love you. Nothing <laughs> but love, baby. Rock Guys has been supporting Trish, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that personally. And the band, you know, has nothing but love for Rock Guys, and we're very proud to be associated with you. And we're coming to your town soon. Keep an eye on the website, TricksterRocks.com. And all I, all I ask people is this. You know, you hear about... People talking about their new albums coming out, and they have nothing but, oh, you got to hear it. It's the greatest thing we ever did. And blah, blah, blah. You know, it's so cliche. All I ask is people, go to iTunes. Don't even pay a dollar. Go and just listen to the free little clips. I think you're going to hear a little something that's going to spark your eyebrow. And you know, you know what? There's something going on here. I truly believe that. Don't buy anything. Get the free preview and listen to it. Or go to YouTube and download a little something there and just listen to something. Get a clue what's going on here, because I tell you what, this is some quality shit that's going to kick your fucking ass. Oh, great. Mark, thank you again so much for taking the time to do this. You know, it's always a pleasure to have you here on Rock Eyes. And, I love uh, you, baby. Give my best to Brian, Mark, everybody, all right? Absolutely, and best of luck with the new CD, man. We are so looking forward to uh, everything, especially the album release party coming up. That's May 10th, Englewood, New Jersey, Burger Performing Arts Center, uh, Trickster uh, CD release party. We're going to be playing with Dokken and Warrant. That is going to be a fucking night from hell. What, we're going to kick some ass. That's, that's gonna, we're going to fucking party like bastards, number one. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, that was Again, that's May 10th, the Bergen Performing Arts Center in Englewood, New Jersey, with Dockin and Warrant, 
Trickster's got their CD release party that night, and you're going to be there front and center, Booby. <laughs> thank you very much, man. Well, first round's on me, pal. Maybe the last one, too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this again, and uh, always a pleasure. Always a you pleasure. You know, I love Best you, Dave. Thanks for everything, baby. Rock guys is kick-ass number one. Take care. Love you, baby. <laughs>